but for this I find it's simpler for me simply to do that. And so I urge you not to bother reading what I'm going to be reading to you, uh, but focus on the images. Uh, this is something that I've put together uh, and started using with students uh, and people who have very little sense of what the civil rights movement was and what the ideas were and so forth. Uh, it's also related to uh, a book uh, on the freedom budget and if you took the artifact with the freedom budget on the cover, if you flip it or the cover of the freedom budget, if you flip it over, you'll see a book that will be coming out this August from Monthly Review Press on the freedom budget and it deals with some of the stuff that you'll be seeing on the screen. Okay, that's uh, not part of my 20 minutes, that's just sort of an introduction. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so, Jobs and Freedom, The March in Washington, The Freedom Budget. Okay, and there's this wonderful book, you must buy it. Uh, it makes wonderful Christmas presents, birthday gifts, and so forth. Uh, after the Civil War and Reconstruction, the so-called Jim Crow system of racist segregation was established throughout the southern United States. Um, Jim Crow was a uh, racist uh, caricature uh, in minstrel shows. And then that was used to uh, talk about the segregation laws, not only segregation laws, but throughout the South, racists were finally successful in preventing most blacks from voting. The Jim Crow system included laws, especially a bogus literacy test, designed to stop blacks from being allowed to vote. Jim Crow was enforced by violence from such groups as the Ku Klux Klan, but also legally by the police. Poverty and unemployment, inadequate housing and education and health care were much higher among blacks than among whites. This was true in the North, too. The creation of black ghettos and the persistence of oppressive conditions of social and economic injustice were features of northern life even without Jim Crow laws. While it may have been more intense in the South, there was an intense hunger for justice among African Americans throughout the land. Over the years, there have been many leaders of struggles for the liberation of African Americans. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of these, another was Malcolm X, who disagreed with King on many things, but agreed with him on the need to struggle for black liberation. In 1954, Thurgood Marshall, lawyer for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, persuaded the Supreme Court that segregation in public education violates the U.S. Constitution. Many Southern whites made it clear they would not accept this. <coughs> White racist mobs and also southern state and local governments mobilized to preserve the Jim Crow system. White citizens councils were organized throughout the South to mobilize racist opposition to civil rights. Dedicated individuals built a massive civil rights movement against racism and they changed the history of our country for the better. Inspired by anti-colonial independence struggles, some civil rights tacticians were drawn from the nonviolent resistance struggles developed by Mohandas Gandhi in India. Martin Luther King became well known for standing up to racist authorities in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955-56, but there were many, <coughs> two of the most prominent being E.D. Nixon and Rosa Parks. Uh, Nixon was uh, a member of the uh, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and was the president of the NAACP there. Rosa Parks was the longtime secretary of that organization in Montgomery. She'd been working for years through the NAACP and her refusal to give up her bus seat to a white man resulted in her arrest and the successful Montgomery bus boycott. The black community of Montgomery rallied, marched, and walked rather than riding the segregated buses, building mass pressure that compelled the courts to order the desegregation of the public transit system. Someone else who helped with the Montgomery bus boycott was Bayard Rustin, a skilled organizer who had been active in radical peace and human rights struggles for years and would remain so. 
Rustin had worked with A.J. Musty of the Fellowship of Reconciliation and David McReynolds of the War Resisters League and became a seasoned organizer and central figure in applying nonviolent tactics in the struggle against the Jim Crow system. And, uh, just give you a, a moment to look at the different <coughs> pictures there. Another nonviolent radical who helped King was Ella Baker. Originally with the NAACP, she helped King establish the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, and also the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. She mentored, taught, and inspired innumerable numbers of young activists. <coughs> Hundreds of dedicated organizers and activists became involved. In its early incarnation, SNCC emphasized a commitment to nonviolence and to an interracial movement to end racism. <coughs> Their first major action was to break the law by sitting in at whites-only lunch counters in the South. SNCC helped to spearhead the struggle for black voting rights in the South. In 1964, it mobilized black and white students from the North to help with the Freedom Summer Project to advance voting rights and political organization. The heroism and dedication of the civil rights activists became legendary. Uh, and among the leading SNCC activists that you can see in the one photo are Fannie Lou Hamer with the microphone, Stokely Carmichael wearing the hat, Eleanor Holmes, who later became Eleanor, Eleanor Holmes Norton, and Ella Baker. Bob Moses, legendary as one of the most thoughtful and capable SNCC organizers. In addition to voter registration, Freedom Summer operated freedom schools that teach children and adults literacy, literature, and history especially African-American history. There was a powerful transformation of consciousness among African-Americans, overcoming fear in order to stand up for their rights. These became words in the songs they sang. Black ministers who were radical activists played an especially important role. Liberal and left-wing Southern whites provided important assistance, like Anne and Carl Braden, the Southern Conference Education Fund, SCEF. You can see Anne Braden there interviewing Rosa Parks. Uh, she wrote a very uh, interesting account that appeared in uh, the magazine Monthly Review. If you've seen the, t the volumes of Taylor Branch's uh, uh, history, uh, this summarizes much of that history, but it, she did it uh, while the history was still unfolding. Another left-wing Southerner was Miles Horton, director of the Highland <coughs> Folk School, which trained labor and civil rights organizers in the South. And there you can see Martin Luther King, Pete Seeger, uh, Horton's daughter, uh, and Rosa Parks and Reverend Ralph Abernathy in 1957. White citizens councils and other defenders of Jim Crow smeared Highlander as a communist training school. Billboards like this one appeared throughout the South. Uh, to attack King, but the civil rights movement couldn't be stopped by that kind of stuff. Another important force for civil rights was the Congress of Racial Equality, headed by James Farmer. While active in the South, CORE had its largest base in the North, where it specialized in nonviolent direct action to challenge various problems related to racism. And these are scenes from New York City. You see Tom Kahn, James Farmer, someone who I don't know, but if I could identify that person, that would be great, uh, and Rochelle Horowitz. And you can see the next photo, Norman and Velma Hill, who are here with us today, being busted. Core activists included Mary Hamilton, Ruth Turner, George Wiley, Floyd McKissick, Donald Elfie, Norman Hill, Velma Hill, many, many, many more. In 1961, Core organized the Freedom Rides, in which integrated delegations of activists in the North took Greyhound buses to the South to challenge racial segregation laws in transportation uh, facilities. They faced arrest and violence. For example, Jim Peck, who was very badly beaten. In 1963, there was a major civil rights campaign initiated in Birmingham, Alabama. It involved large numbers of young people. Martin Luther King's uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference played a central role in these protests. The police engaged in systematic intimidation, but the protests grew. Fire hoses were turned on the protesters. There were police dogs 
there were massive arrests. Children were arrested too. The jails were filled. White clergymen in Birmingham sharply criticized Reverend King for causing so much trouble. King responded with his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which is worth reading today. There were many martyrs, most of them African-American activists such as Alabama's outstanding NAACP leader, Medgar Evers. Some of the martyrs were children. In 1964, three civil rights activists, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, disappeared during Freedom Summer. Their bodies were found some weeks later. In 1965, Northern Civil Rights volunteer Viola Liuzzo was shot in the head one night in Alabama when she drove black civil rights protesters back to their homes. Southern police forces were not interested in solving such murders. Some were involved in helping to carry them out. A. Philip Randolph, prominent black trade union leader and a veteran of many protests, called for a 1963 March on Washington to advance civil rights. This is the 50th anniversary year. Uh, I'm thinking I, I'd like to go down to Washington for the, uh, the march this year. Maybe some of us will meet there. Randolph and his aide, uh, aide Bayard Rustin, decided to call it a march for jobs and freedom to link the issues of racial justice and economic justice. Rustin, central organizer for the march, worked tirelessly with the treasurer for the march, trade, un trade unionist Cleveland Robinson, and with many, many others. The formal leadership of the march consisted of the nation's most prominent civil rights leaders, John Lewis of SNCC, Whitney Young of the Urban League, Randolph King, Farmer, and Roy Wilkins of the NAACP. But what made the march a success was the mass participation. People came from across the land. Organizers hoped for at least 100,000. Police estimates put the crowd at 250,000. Some have said it was twice that size. Rustin asked the outstanding actors, husband and wife Ossie Davis and Ruby Dee, to organize entertainers and show business celebrities for the march, and they did. Among the singers were Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. In the other photo you can see Charlton Heston and author James Baldwin, Sidney Poitier, Marlon Brando, Harry Belafonte, and there were many others on hand. But the march was made so impressive by the many, many everyday people who became part of it and who helped to make history. The words and ideas of Rustin, King, and others who, had, who spoke had greater resonance because of those who rallied to their words and ideas. The mass protests created a popular pressure that compelled passage and enforcement of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, ending the Jim Crow system. Even with the right to vote, and the end of segregation laws, poverty and unemployment remained twice as high among blacks as among whites. Randolph, Rustin, King, and others concluded the best solution was full employment and a decent standard of living for all people. Many prominent civil rights figures were socialists, believing that there was a link between racial justice and economic justice. By socialism, they meant our economy should be owned by society, should be democratically controlled, should be used to meet the needs of all. And what I'm emphasizing here, what I emphasize in the book, is the uh, key role especially played by members of the Socialist Party. Many of the people that we've seen in the uh, previous photos, uh, not all, but many who were socialists were members of that party. They contributed activism, but also analysis and strategy. Uh, the uh, thing on the, over here, that was uh, something put out by the Young People Socialist League. It was actually a resolution at a convention of the Young People Socialist League, discussed and, and adopted and then put into practice. And then Tom Kahn's classic, The Economics of Equality. Radical journalist I.F. Stone wrote that a two-day conference on the civil rights revolution organized by the Socialist Party and attended by 400 activists the day after the March on Washington 
provided discussions far superior to the speeches at the march, arguing that the civil rights movement must be merged into a broader plan for social change. And you've got a flyer that urges people to go to that conference. As socialists, they wanted decent jobs for all, an end to poverty, decent housing for all, decent health care for all, decent education for all, human rights for all, ruled by the people, democracy over our political and economic life. Such values were contained in a freedom budget for all Americans that they put forward in 1966. Endorsed by over 200 prominent civil rights, labor, religious, and academic leaders, it offered a plan to end poverty within a 10-year period. How many of you have been born since 1976? Since 1970, you would have been born into a society without poverty if this had been implemented. Totally different reality. The Freedom Budget was designed to provide decent living conditions and dignity for all eliminating the material causes of racism. People are competing for scarce resources uh, from different racial groups that's going to uh, uh, be translated into racial antagonisms. By eliminating those material causes, you create a whole different culture. But at the same time that the freedom budget was put forward, the US military escalation in Vietnam was taking place drawing energy and resources away from resolving racial and economic injustices. This was a problem. Max Schachtman, a prominent figure in the Socialist Party, had persuaded his comrades that electoral politics and support of the Democratic Party should be keystones for their strategy. And the Democratic President, Lyndon B. Johnson, was committed to a bipartisan policy of defeating communism in Vietnam. The war in Vietnam split the forces that might have supported the freedom budget. Some supporters, not all, joined with Martin Luther King to mobilize against the war. You see King there marching with uh, not only Dr. Benjamin Spock, but also Monsignor Charles Owen Rice. He's from Pittsburgh, I, I knew that guy. Uh, and there were many others. King's last years included the struggle for the freedom budget, the poor people's campaign, the Memphis sanitation workers strike, all seeking to secure economic justice for the majority of people. The problem with the freedom budget was that it would have meant an economic and political power shift away from the wealthy. The wealthy and the politicians whom they funded, Democrats as well as Republicans, didn't want to allow that. The divided civil rights movement and decline of the struggle meant they didn't have to. Persisting economic justice, growing inequality, the spread of poverty, unemployment and underemployment, declining living standards, declining quality of life, welcome to our world today. But the freedom budget was designed to do away with such things. The civil rights agenda of such people as Randolph, Rustin, and King was partly fulfilled. They accomplished what? Jim Crow segregation laws were knocked down. Voting rights guaranteed to all regardless of race. Culture of fear in the South significantly pushed back. Greater dignity and pride for African Americans. Positive shifts among whites and in the larger culture regarding race. And then there were the things that were not accomplished. Racism and racial tensions have yet to be fully overcome. Poverty, with all its negativity, has yet to be overcome. Unemployment and economic insecurity have yet to be overcome. Decent housing and health care have yet to be provided for all. Good education has yet to be provided for all. Those who hope for a better future can learn much from the experiences of the civil rights movement. These are all pictures showing struggles in my hometown, in Pittsburgh. I know this is not just happening in Pittsburgh. This is happening all across the country. This is not the end. That's my show. My name is Brian Jones. I'll just say a little bit more about myself. I'm uh, a New York City public school teacher. I taught for elementary school grades for eight years in Harlem, and last year I taught in Brooklyn. Uh, 
And this year I'm on an unpaid leave from the Department of Education helping look after my three-year-old daughter. And I also began a doctoral program in urban education at the CUNY Graduate Center. So I'm not a professional historian, um, like my fellow panelists here. And then there's people in the audience who've lived through uh, and are participants of this struggle. So I have to say I'm a little bit nervous about um, my credentials to stand here and make arguments about the civil rights movement. So I'll try to keep my comments brief and limited and say them with a, a note of humility that I expect I probably have more to learn here than to teach. Um, the, one of the ways that these discussions, I think the reason Paul asked me to be on this panel is that he and I over the years have had a series of discussions about how we, that is radicals who are trying to carry forward this project, radicals who see ourselves in, not in classroom media services, but in the history of, in building on the legacy of the civil rights movement, how should we look at the role of radicals in the movement? How should we understand them? And one of our first debates was whether or not Martin Luther King was a socialist. And originally I argued that he was not. And Paul convinced me that he was. And if you read Paul's piece that he handed out here, he actually goes through um, quite a number of, quite a bit of evidence that not only that King and Randolph, that many of the leading lights of the civil rights movement were socialists. And not only, as I had initially thought, did they radicalize, you know, that King changed greatly over time, started off just believing in Christian love and ended up believing that we had to end capitalism, but as I think Paul shows, that people like King had radical ideas going way back to the very beginning of their political life um, and ideas. So I'm convinced. Um, but then I think about it um, from another angle. And um, you know, the more you read about the civil rights movement, the more it's, it's interesting. And, and as Paul mentioned, the way that people like FBI director J. Edgar Hoover spent countless manpower, hours, wiretaps trying to prove the very point that Paul has not proved, that King was a uh, socialist and that basically the civil rights movement had socialists and communists and radicals behind. Um, in, in J. Edgar Hoover should have hired Paul LeBlanc. He would, have, he would have had all the evidence that he needed. So of course, then we have to say that there's something else, that the Hoovers of the world who have their contemporaries as let's say like Andrew Breitbart and Fox News who wanna also prove that behind every social struggle there's all these radicals, well, of course, because they're right in a sense that behind almost every social struggle in America, there are radicals who play an important role in it. But we have to then say something a little bit more about that, which is that the radicalism of the movement doesn't just emerge from the head of the radicals or just from their ideas. Um, it's not just that they had a strategy about moving from civil rights to broader economic questions, but that that is the trajectory of any social struggle that proceeds and actually grows and gains strength. And then in particular, the situation of African Americans in the United States, if they were to stir, could not move in any other way. Marx said the same thing about the proletarian struggle in general, that people on the bottom, when they stir, cannot help but throw up the whole superincumbent strata that sits on top of them. Similarly, African Americans could not help but stir, regardless of what they stirred for, civil rights, equality, the ability to sit here or vote there, without pressing and pushing on the whole superincumbent strata that sat on top of them in the South and in the North. Bayard Rustin himself echoed Marx when he said, I believe the Negro struggle for equality in America is essentially revolutionary. And he says, and he goes on to say, this is despite what their starting point might be, despite what it is that they're going in, what their perception is going into struggle. While most Negroes in their hearts unquestionably seek, this is Rustin, seek only to enjoy the fruits of American society as it is now, as it now exists, their quest cannot objectively be satisfied within the framework of existing political and economic relations. So he's basically saying that, that, that there's, it's not a question of whether or not Rustin himself is a card-carrying member of this or that group. It's a question of the objective position of African Americans in society. They, they cannot go forward without bumping up against all of those uh, relations and therefore end up as a more uh, as a more radical movement. I mean, it's just it's common sense. People who are hungry, don't have enough to eat, and the, who fight over uh, the question of voting aren't going to forget about their hunger as they fight over a question of voting or of, of civil rights, narrowly conceived. 
And same to um, certainly in the northern cities that where the civil rights movement, um, where, where people stir and begin to organize and fight in the northern cities as well, they face conditions that are dramatic. Um, one study, had, well, the Kerner Commission from 68 uh, noted that in Chicago and New York, 43, I mean, think about 1968, as late as 68, 43% of non-white housing was without full plumbing in Chicago and New York in 1968. In St. Louis and Detroit, it was more than 50% did not have full plumbing. So again, it's not just that the radicalism emerges from the ideas of the radicals, it emerges from the position that people are in and what it is that they must end up fighting for as they gain strength and confidence. But of course, the radicals play a role. Uh, they play a brilliant role. They are people like Barry Rustin are dynamic, Philip Randolph dynamic, courageous, um, brilliant, um, and they play an absolutely essential role organizationally, politically, guiding the movement. Um, but as Paul highlights, they were radicals and they were after some a, a much bigger transformation that we now see in, in hindsight did not occur. And I think it's inevitable that a new black radical movement will happen in America because the conditions persist. And that it will look back to this history to try to assimilate its lessons. It will have to assimilate parts of it and reject other parts. And to me, that's what I want to talk about is what, how will a new movement look back at this history? What will it say about it? Um, what will it say about why these brilliant, courageous people did not achieve um, this? And arguably, argue why they did not achieve a larger restructuring that they aimed for. And arguably, it was not possible. This is one argument. It was simply not possible at that juncture in history for that struggle to go forward. The communists had been liquidated by, as an organized force by McCarthyism. Um, and, that, and that had had a conservatizing effect on the trade unions and on the trade union movement. And there was just not simply enough of a base, in the, in the, a radical base in the unions to carry forward that project. Or you could say the, pro, the relative prosperity, especially of, of uh, whites, of working class whites relative st economic stability um, was a conservatizing force that just meant that they would not, they did not have 43 or 50%, um, you know, not having plumbing in their homes in 1968 and just were not going to rise to the same level of anger and radicalization as African Americans. Pos that's, that's arguable. Um, and certainly we have to say that the American ruling class, that there was no section of the American ruling class, as Paul points out, that was going to move from a struggle for formal legal equality to profound economic restructuring. That just was not going to happen. Um, and yet, you have, at the same time though, things that pointed towards the project of larger scale restructuring. Certainly, you had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who had been drawn into active participation in these movements one way or another. And then along with that, actually I think it's fine. It's like stage lights, the echo light. I'm used to it. We, you had, um, certainly in addition to tens or hundreds of thousands of people who'd been activated and organized, you had millions of people who were radicalized and who considered themselves revolutionaries one way or another. Their ideas in the benevolence of the government dashed, whether in Mississippi or in Vietnam. You had the urban centers burning, um, in hundreds of them burning in the United States between the years 1964 and 68. And so many people looked at that and said, we have the material here for a revolution in the United States, for a profound transformation. And I, I think it's, it's, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm curious to know Paul's reaction to, is what do we think was possible at that juncture in history? I think there's another thing about, you know, Rustin said that Rustin said that the politics of what it, by that moment, by, by 60, well, even earlier, by the politics that were, that were emerging in 64 and 65 of um, the politics of Malcolm X, the politics of, of people calling for black power, um, of people who were taking a harder stance on Vietnam for revolution, um, separating from liberals, and in some cases separating themselves from all whites, I mean, forming more nationalist-oriented organizations. Bayard Rustin says, that those politics are a no-win politics, that they're a dead end, that African Americans have to have some kind of a coalition partner. 
And in some sense, you have to say that Rustin was right, obviously, that those politics, people who tried to build some kind of revolutionary um, um, movement did not, also did not succeed. And it seems like it's true that African Americans, being a minority of the population, have to have some kind of coalition partner. Um, but did it have to be a coalition with the Democratic Party? It seems like uh, Martin Luther King, and arguably, possibly even, you could argue, Malcolm X, tried to pursue, at the end of their respective lives, a different coalition, a coalition of <laughs> especially King workers and the oppressed. Um, and King made uh, separated himself from the Democratic Party um, through a series of speeches from 65, 66, and then especially with a very sharp speech in 67, uh, criticizing the war in Vietnam as, as imperialist um, and calling the American government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. The freedom budget actually tried to, at a moment when the Vietnam War was itself one of the principal things radicalizing millions of people, the freedom budget dodged the issue because it felt that it had to, to stay in a coalition with the Democratic Party, it had to. And so it said, I'm just gonna quote a little bit from the pages of the freedom budget, it said, the freedom budget is not predicated on cutbacks to national defense, nor on one or another position regarding the Vietnam conflict, which is basically a thorny question to be viewed in its own terms. It's just a straightforward dodge. Like, we're not gonna talk about that, that's a separate issue. It also said, we reject the argument that the termination of the, of the this is even stronger, we reject the argument that the termination of the Vietnam conflict is the prerequisite for acceleration of domestic social programs. So there's a tremendous irony here where you have, where it's true that, pe that people who were socialists played this essential role in the civil rights movement. There's just no question about it. Some of them card-carrying members of socialist organizations. But you have this tremendous irony where at the, in this later phase, where some of them end up to the right of people who started off in divinity school or wherever and ended up as radicals, where, where people who radicalized in the movement ended up to the left of the radicals who had in many ways made it happen. You know, Martin Luther King met with uh, John Kennedy once, and Kennedy pulled him aside and said, look, Rustin, Stanley Levinson, these people are communists. This is Kennedy talking to King. You have to get rid of these people. You have to have no association with these people. And Rustin and Levinson, nearly everything they're arguing to King when Vietnam War is coming up is, you've got to stay with Kennedy. You've got to stay with Johnson. You've got to stay with the Democrats. And King, interestingly, says, you know, well, I'm going to break with Johnson, but stay with, with the communists. Um, I think that a new black movement is going to have to look back at this history and have some ideas about how what that movement faced are very similar to, to questions that we are facing today, especially, if, and of course, the Democratic Party. Because in some ways, the project that Rustin then laid out about taking over the Democratic Party um, has been accomplished. I mean, there were, I think, 200 black elected officials in 1965, and there's over 8,000 today. The Congressional Black Caucus is one of the most powerful. It has, uh, it took in $55 million in the first few years of the 2000s in corporate contributions. They spent as much on, decor on their decorator for uh, one of their parties, $300,000, as they gave out in one year in internships. So they are, you know, they're getting money from Coca-Cola, from Walmart, from AT&T. So they're thoroughly integrated with uh, American capital. And certainly the prospect of, of making some kind of common cause with the Democratic Party to win the struggles ahead of us is, is not in the offing. And there are, as there were then, particular um, particular aspects of racism that are, and of course racism, but of, but of oppression that fall on African Americans disproportionately in a way that, that is different from what falls upon uh, working class and poor white people, namely what Michelle Alexander calls the invisible cage of post-felony conviction, the new Jim Crow, which largely goes by the, uh, the life largely hides behind a policy of official colorblindness not just in the prisons and the criminal justice system, but in housing, in education. We have an official policy of colorblindness and then tremendous racism, segregation, um, and oppression. And we have uh, the politics of personal responsibility, which in some cases are being argued. That is, blame yourself, it's your own damn fault, which Rustin and others argued brilliantly against in their day, but clearly has now become a dominant idea um, that is put out by black celebrities, black elite, and politicians.
And so a new black movement has to go up against all of that in some way and find a way to identify with and assimilate the lessons and the struggles of, uh, of the civil rights movement. Um, and I think it's going to, um, it's, it's, it, I think we have a lot to learn from this history. Um, but I think, I feel like our struggle that we have going from going this moment forward is going to look profoundly different. There's one last thing I just want to throw out, which is, and I only have like four minutes left, is the, the, the logic of Rustin's position, which I feel like um, makes so much sense from his perspective of holding fast to the Democratic Party and to that, that coalition. It's just, it's, it's inescapable that that had the strategy of using the Northern liberals and even sections of the American ruling class was effective. I mean, what was the Civil War if not a, a use of the Northern state to smash um, the slaveocracy in the South? What was the Civil Rights Movement if not the, the, the finishing of that work and again dragging the Northern liberals into it, and in some cases, the state? I mean, Ruby, little Ruby Bridges integrated that school with armed guards, not federal troops, in the South protecting her from the crackers. And so that strategy of, of having that very, the federal government as a protector, as a powerful coalition partner, is deeply etched in black politics um, on, on that, in that score and makes perfect sense as a strategy. It just seems that now, the struggle that we have from this moment forward, which these folks grappled with, um, is going to require a different kind of coalition um, and, and uh, a more radical politics. And, and arguably is a, is a harder struggle that we face for those reasons. So anyway, thank you. I'm gonna make two arguments. Um, one is an argument about discontinuity in the black freedom struggle during the middle decades of the 20th century. The other is an argument about continuity. Or continuity despite discontinuity. The first argument is that there was, in fact, a mass anti-racist protest movement emerging by the mid-1940s, well before the heyday of the civil rights movement that we all know and love. Um, labor unions and leftist groups were central to that movement in a way that I think they, they really weren't, or weren't to the same extent um, during the movement of the 60s. However, uh, the Red Scare that Brian mentioned, uh, state repression, but not only, um, also internal dissension, factionalism uh, within the left that was stoked by um, McCarthyism and whatnot, <coughs> recast the, anti, the broad anti-racist movement that was developing, um, weakened labor on the left, and, and in some ways decimated um, a whole host of organizations that were uh, in, in, in the, at the leading edge of the fight. Um, as a result, there was actually a lull in mass protest during uh, the, the, the late 40s, early 50s, uh, during which lawsuits and lobbying became dominant tactics. This is not to poo-poo lawsuits and lobbying, which can play an important role um, in, in any struggle, um, but they became dominant tactics as opposed to merely one uh, set of tactics in a broader repertoire that included more disruptive things. Um, so of course, the NAACP made major gain, legal gains um, through these tactics, um, but nevertheless, this was not um, a, the, a mass movement capable of overturning Jim Crow, let alone some of the other changes that people talked about earlier. Um, as a result of um, this, this reconstitution of the, the movement field, um, when the mass movement did reemerge, beginning in the mid-50s and, and in earnest in the 60s, uh, the church assumed a much more central leadership role. There were another, other, other changes as well. Um, I mention this just because I think there's a tendency, especially in my discipline in sociology, to assume that um, ministerial leadership was the, the more or less inevitable natural form in which the, the movement would emerge, and, and, and the ideology of the church, um, I think actually things were a bit more contingent. Anyways, so um, one of the components of my project is to actually try to reconstruct um, systematically, and that is, you know, identify the key organizations, their overlapping memberships, their relative sizes and strength at various uh, points from the, the 30s to actually the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, I'll just give a couple snapshots about the crucial period I'm talking about here, where things change so dramatically. <coughs> So you hear, here's the, in the 1940s, um, the NAACP is a central player. Um, churches are involved in the movement, but it's mostly a, sort of a, a isolated um, 
movement churches. Most churches are actually not deeply involved in leading protest, um, although some of their members might participate. Um, but what, what's the, the tales aside, what's really noteworthy here is that you see the, the Communist Party is at the center of much of what's going on. Um, this was true in the 30s. It was also true after the Second World War. Um, and the NAACP grew dramatically during the Second World War. Um, in the 30s, the CP and the NAACP were actually roughly the same size. Uh, and, and the CP had a much uh, more active base than the NAACP did in that period. The NAACP ballooned during the, during the Second World War. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the Communist Party and a host of sort of auxiliary organizations in which the CP either was in the leadership or was deeply um, involved, sometimes founded them, sometimes just joined them. Um, one of the organizations I've been studying is a group called the American Veterans Committee, which was not founded by the CP, CP but many CP um, actors were involved and, and, and led some of the most uh, militant chapters. Um, but again, you see, you see a panoply of organizations in which the, the CP is quite central. Now, um, when I talk to my students about civil rights, they find this uh, bizarre, if not unbelievable. But of course, to make sense of why J. Edgar Hoover is you know, looking for reds under the bed, um, there's a prior history. I mean, Hoover cuts his teeth fighting communists. That's, I mean, that's essentially what, you know, what, what his agency is created to do. Um, my point here, though, is that, is that the CP was, was deeply involved in, in the anti-racist struggle, uh, and they were way out in front, um, in, in, in the, especially during the Depression. This was before the NAACP even committed itself to um, you know, abolishing separate but equal. They still wanted to equalize the, you know, the separate school. The CP is calling for equality in all aspects, all aspects of life, including social equality, rights into marriage. They're running a black man for vice president. And I think this is un, it's unheard of. Um, they're deeply involved in struggles to desegregate um, popular sports like baseball. In this case, uh, I found bowling. They were, um, <laughs> This is actually, well, I, I, I promise to give a couple sports tidbits to sports fan, any sports fan here? Maybe not bowlers, bowlers are probably not popular anymore. Um, actually, the bowling case is interesting, if only because, um, well, again, yeah, my discipline, there's, there's this really famous book called Bowling Alone, um, which is arguing that if only we had more bowling leagues, um, you know, and things like that, I mean, not literally just bowling, but um, where people could get together and talk about politics. Of course, what the book ignores is that um, league bowling in the United States was completely segregated it, it, during the period in question, and it was folks like the communists who were um, out in front trying to, to, to integrate it. Anyways, again, union members were involved in these struggles. Um, more centrally, I think, especially in terms of direct action, more centrally than they were in the 60s, um, there were uh, quite a number of unions that were involved, um, I think a more peripheral way, in protests. Um, 63 Marshall Washington's an interesting case. I, mean, I, I won't go too much into it. I've done a bit of, bit of research on who exactly attended the march, which unions brought how many people. Um, and there are a number of unions that really did turn people out. But again, 63 March is uh, pretty low risk compared to um, you know, sit-ins where you're risking a mass arrest. Maybe that's more so in retrospect, but I think most folks who were mobilizing for the march had a pretty good idea. The unions that, that brought people, that, you know, their members were probably not getting arrested. That wasn't the case in the 40s when you were sitting sitting in at a restaurant or something like that, where you can almost be certain that you were gonna, you're gonna risk arrest. Um, again, I mentioned I'm studying this group called the American Veterans Committee. Um, almost completely forgotten today, but um, veterans who came back from World War II, radicalized, wanting to, that we fought fascism abroad, we're coming home, we, want, we don't want the same kind of society. We want security in our lives. We want to fight racism. That was certainly the attitude of black Americans. Um, but also lots of white Americans who ideas, whose ideas change in the course of the struggle and through working um, in some cases with, with black, other, other black uh, enlisted people. The ABC um, quickly, and, and, and these folks didn't want to join the American Legion, which is a segregated organization, or the VFW, which is a segregated organization, didn't rep and quite conservative. I mean, the, the, the American Legion was basically a strike-breaking outfit in the early part of the 20th century. ABC was committed to, to social justice and, and, and on, on principle, an integrated organization. It was the first integrated veterans organization since the days of the Civil War, you know, Grand Army of the Republic. Um, they formed a thousand chapters with about a hundred thousand members in a little over a year, including chapters throughout the Deep South, some of which I've studied pretty closely. Um, the records are scarce, but they're there. And um, yeah, I can't get into too much of the, the story, but you, you get a sense. Again, they, they were part of the anti-racist mass movement in this period. Uh, well, here's a slide. In, in, for example, in Jackson, Mississippi, 
they had a chapter that grew to about 350 members, mostly um, black vets. It was all black, de facto all black chapter, um, just because it's Mississippi. And um, they were mostly students at black um, colleges, teachers' colleges, and trade schools. And they played a, a critical role that's not in the historiography at all, really. It's, it's just not. Um, in mobilizing black vets from across um, the state of Mississippi to testify at public hearings against the state senator, Theodore Bilbo, the arch racist in the U.S. Senate, um, about how when they tried to vote that they would be you know, threatened and intimidated. So basically, they really were risking their lives to come out in public and say, my name is uh, Etoy Fletcher, and I was flogged when I tried to, tried to vote um, in Brandon, and um, I think Bilbo needs to be tossed out of the Senate. Um, he probably would have been tossed out of the fact that he died of throat cancer. But anyway, um, it was extremely risky stuff, and the ABC chapter there was, was actually central, vital to, to mobilizing black vets. Uh, more sports. Um, this wasn't something I was intending to research. I just came across lots of evidence uh, that Joe Lewis, who's known as the, you know, the, the non-political black boxer, unlike Jack Johnson before, and unlike Muhammad Ali later, this is completely false. During the heyday of the, the black left after the Second World War, Lewis supported communist Ben Davis for city council. He appeared at rallies, in this case, um, raising money for the Southern Conference of Human Welfare, um, a progressive organization um, in the, rooted in the South. Um, he defended Paul Robeson when Paul Robeson came under attack from, from the government, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm a sociologist by training, whatever that means. Um, so you know, I'm supposed to count stuff. And, uh, um, I won't get too much into it, but one part of my project was actually trying to quantify like, how much protest was there. Was there you know, does the trajectory fit the story I'm telling? Um, and the short answer is yes. Um, I won't get too much into it. But again, you can see the, the, the arc. If you're really curious about the methods and all that and why I bothered to do it. And people have actually tried to do this before. They came up with basically a flat line because they were so biased and what they counted as a, as, a, as a civil rights protest. Basically anything led by communists, they didn't even count because um, you know, they assumed that, that it, has, it couldn't have anything to do with black people. There's more to it than that, but that's, that's sort of long story short. Um, but yeah, you can see a pretty clear pattern of a, a, a rising uh, arc of struggle after the Second World War and a fairly rapid lurch downward during um, the, the, the McCarthy era, some blips and bleeps, uh, but basically things are on a, a downward arc until um, really 55, 56 with the, the resurgence of the movement around the bus boycotts in the wake of the Emmett Till case and, and coming out of uh, the, Brown, the Brown decision. Um, so that's part of the story is the upper arc. Here's the organizational field in 1946, but there it is in say 1955. Mm -hmm. Watch it again. So a diverse movement, the CP very central. Now, Basically, the CP, it still exists, but all the auxiliary organizations, the so-called front groups, are, are decimated. They're white, more or less white in the field, with a couple of exceptions, a couple of little remnants, like the Southern Conference Educational Fund. Some of these remnants actually play important roles later on, um, in part because the field is so, is so white clean that even small groups can play an outsized role. Um, but even the NYCP has shrunken to about half its post-war height. What's going on in this period? Again, I, I sort of take most of this as red, but um, just as a refresher, right? This is the era of the Taft Hartley Act, which is making it, you know, criminal, uh, making it illegal for communists um, to to be officers of unions. The Smith Act, uh, which is you know jailing the leaders of, in particular, the Communist Party, also Trotskyist groups. Um, mass vigilante violence against the left, and in particular the black left. <laughs> Um, violence against white anti-racist actors on the shop floor. This one speaks for itself, I think. That's the tenor of that period. In um, the case of the American Veterans Committee, I mentioned, the group was, not, was never directly oppressed by the U.S. government. However, uh, fearing that that might happen, there is an internal, mm -hmm. um, internal purge. Um, again, if you're interested, I can tell more of the story, but you get some idea. And the group didn't collapse, but they, they shrunk to a, you know, a, a, a tiny fraction of their, 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 their 100,000 at their height. 
What might the movement have looked like if not for this mass repression? I think there's a couple ways you can get traction on that question. I mean, one is you can sort of just extrapolate from the trend prior to, to the repression. Um, but I think we could also look at some exceptional cases of old enough groups that actually managed to avoid being crushed or driven into an isolated corner without having to purge their leftist leadership. In particular, um, one case I looked at closely is the United Pathless Workers of America. How much do you want time? Um, about seven minutes. All right, I'll go faster. Um, I'll skirt over this quickly, but for example, I, I'm working on a paper about uh, the packing house workers' response to the murder of Emmett Till. And it turns out in Chicago, which is actually a packing house worker stronghold, they were the first organization to call a mass protest meeting. I invited Emmett's mom to speak, which is, of course, in the tradition of, uh, of the, the sort of depression in World War II era black lab to get the moms of, uh, of lynch victims to, to speak their own story. Um, they go on to play a critical role in bankrolling um, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference during its first year. The total budget of SCLC in 1957 was about $13,000, 11,000 of which came from the packing house workers. And King himself said, you know, without your aid, our, our infant organization probably would have died in the cradle. Um, but, you know, when you think of the Civil Rights Movement, you don't think of white meat packers in Des Moines picketing Woolworths. Um, but predictably, I think, um, groups like this, exceptional groups, were doing that. I think we might have seen more of that. This, the character of the struggle might have been somewhat different if there was the, 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 the plausibility of a, of a powerful alliance between um, black students, say, or the church in the South, and um, aggressive anti-racist um, majority white unions like the packing house workers. Why does it matter? Well, I'm already alluding to this. Oh, two, two reasons, I think. First, it has to do with the limits of the movement, what we've been talking about, the limits of the civil rights movement's accomplishments. I think Paul's uh, balance sheet was, was, was perf perfectly correct. Um, on the one hand, the formal inequality is broken down, largely, but the, a lot of the de facto inequality, particularly the economic inequality, persists, um, and we need to grapple with how to tackle that the next time around. Um, what are the prospects for building a black labor alliance um, that actually you know, tackles both race and class issues aggressively. Um, also, I think in terms of understanding the turn towards separatism, black nationalism, um, I don't think this is the only factor, but the, the repression of the, the, the black labor left in the 40s and early 50s creates a vacuum where the argument that we need a strategy where we're going to unite you know, labor and civil rights well, what? Oh, so you, mean, you mean the unions that support the war, that support the Democratic Party? Why would they want to form that alliance. Mm -hmm. it, it's not nearly as plausible as it might have been had there actually been a vibrant militant uh, anti-racist labor movement and the auxiliary organ organizations that were committed to direct action and so forth. So that was argument one about discontinuity and its impact. Argument number two, and I'll, I'll, I'll go yikes, fast, okay. Despite the decimation of the old left, a host of talented organizers with backgrounds in the labor and leftist struggles of the 30s and 40s went on to play important leadership roles in the movement of the 60s. Um, and you've both already alluded to this, so I, I can skip over a little quickly. Um, there are other mechanisms of continuity, I think, for example, the phenomenon of red diaper babies, um, old left youth groups that you know, sort of keep on keeping on and then manage to recruit a, a new generation of activists to ideas that were developed in that earlier crucible. Um, Paul, I think you, you have this picture up, right? This is a very, very famous um, picture of Elizabeth Eckford being you know, chased by Hazel Massery. Um, most people know that story, and if you watch Oprah, you know that they, they hugged each other, and don't worry, racism's all gone now, right. a couple years ago, right? Um, what most folks don't know is who this other person was. I think if your picture's not totally cut off, um, it's assumed that she's part of the mob. In fact, that's, um, that's Grace Lorch, um, who the, was a communist, and she was actually following Elizabeth to protect her from the mob. She actually escorted her onto a bus to make sure she wasn't tramp, you know, beaten to death or whatever, um, bloody. Um, what was she doing down there? Her husband, Lee Lorch, was teaching at Philander Smith College. He'd been blacklisted from a whole host of universities um, up here. Uh, was it, was it NYU or City, it's NYU, it's NYU, or City College? I want to say NYU. Um, he was a math prof. Uh, he led the struggle to desegregate Stuyvesant Town, where I was born, and uh, was blacklisted for that. Uh, he was also communist, and they moved south because they get a job. Ends up that Lee Lorch becomes Daisy Bates' right-hand man in the, in the Little Rock NAACP, and um, it was actually a coincidence that, that, um, that Grace was just sort of 
driving by on the way to work. She was a teacher active in Boston, um, in, the, in the left wing of the teachers union and so forth. Um, but yeah, why do I raise this? Because you scratch the surface of the civil rights movement and you see folks like this almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. They may not be known, they may be undercover or whatever, but they're everywhere. At least that's what I'm finding. Another, another famous, probably the second most, those are the two most famous pictures of the civil rights movement, right? Other than you know, King with his outstretched arm and the Marshall Washington. Um, this is actually not 1960, it's 63 in Jackson. Um, I won't tell you who all these people are, but this is John Salter, sociology prof at Tougaloo. And um, he's older than he looks. Um, Salter grew up in the Pacific Northwest. He was around the Mine Mill and Swelter, Mine Mill and Smelter Union, a communist led union. Um, he was active briefly in the IWW. During the 50s, he wrote for the American Socialist. He was, he was a red. Um, and he was in the thick of the struggle. He wasn't just there, he actually was the, 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 the main advisor to the NAACP youth group that led the sit-ins in Jackson. Uh, if I had more time, I'd talk about Howard Zinn. Zinn was a leading figure in the American Veterans Committee in New York. Um, he was the elected leader for the, all the Brooklyn chapters in 46-47. Uh, um, it's a complicated story, but during the, during the attack on the left, uh, he was booted out of the group. Um, but I think, uh, I find it surprising that it's not more puzzling to more people that Zinn was so centrally involved in SNCC. It wasn't just that he was teaching at a, a college where there was students who were getting active and he was sympathetic. It, um, it wasn't just that he sort of you know, grew up in the 30s and had been around activist politics. He was actually himself a mass leader um, during the 40s, in the American Veterans Committee in particular. Um, and so it was, I, 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 in terms of understanding not only is why he was involved, but he actually becomes an executive board member of SNCC. It's not because he wrote you know, good articles about them, he did, but they actually invited him to be a, a, a leader. This guy you know, is a 40-something Jew from New York. How does that guy end up in the leadership of SNCC? You, 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 you gotta dig it deeper into the biography and you realize that again, this, this, in Zinn's case, for, for example, someone who was a mass leader who um, stayed with the struggle uh, through twists and turns and, and reemerged as a leader in the 60s. There, and there's Zinn marching back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Um, my most systematic research about this sort of continuity is, is the case of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, and I mostly focus on uh, top leadership positions, officers, um, executive staff, executive directors, program coordinators, so on and so forth. Um, and you know, well, there's pages and pages of, 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 of this kind of bi biographical trajectory. Folks that get passed through the 30s and 40s left, um, may have made various ideological sort of twists, turns, contortions, they change the in some ways. My point is not so much that, the, that there's complete ideological continuity, it's that they developed a skill set that becomes critical later on. Who knows how to organize a march on Washington? That's not something, you, you know, oh, I'll, I'll just organize a march on um, Someone like Rustin had actually gone through several phases with the March on Washington movement, um, and with, with the, the sort of earlier marches in the 50s, and people learned how to do this stuff. You had to learn it somewhere. <coughs> Anyways, um, people have questions about particular individuals, I'd be happy to let Actually, I'll say one thing about, here's a, so, a real surprise to me, C.T. Vivian. C.T. Vivian, you know, anyone who's studying the civil rights movement knows Vivian as being you know, a key figure in the Nashville movement, then becomes um, the, uh, essentially the coordinator of chapters for SCLC in the mid-60s. Um, he's known as, you know, a religious figure. One of the folks who was motivated by, you know, anti-racism came out of simply the church, the, church, the, the social gospel church of the church. That's certainly part of it, but there's more to it. In fact, he lived in Peoria um, in his 20s um, during the 1940s when the dominant, um, well, the big, big employer in Peoria at the time was Caterpillar Tractor, which was organized by the Farm Equipment Union, a communist-led union. Vivian was mentored by a guy named A.J. Martin, who was a black, the leading black communist in the plant and um, who was also the president of the Peoria NAACP at that time. So this, these, even folks that, you know, it seems like they have, they, they, they're, 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 they're church figures, that's not necessarily compatible with, with having been, you know, gone through some of these, uh, these, these old left struggles and learned from them and be inspired by them and so forth. Anyway, I'll be real brief because I'm going to stop. Why does this matter? As I said, skills hold, honed in these old left struggles. I think are an unrecognized, or little recognized sort, I mean, Paul's an exception. The historiography, is, is, it's not well registered that this is an important source of the movement's strength. We can talk about ideological influence as well. I think it is complicated. Again, someone like Levis, you know, 
around the CP, but then you know, is arguing not for King not to come out against the war. But there is a sort of certainly a broad ethos that within SCLC that we need to grapple with with, uh, with economic issues. It wasn't. Uh, and, and King, I mean, King was King is himself really part of the, the 40s popular front milieu to a much greater extent than I think people realize. Um, I found in my research, for example, is that all, all of his professors and mentors at Morehouse are not just social gospelers; they are. They're actually involved in popular front groups. So Benjamin Mays is is, is a state leader of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare, um, is a, a, is a supporter of the Southern Negro Youth Congress. Um, oh, who else? Walter Chivers, that, who um, King took 10 classes with um, in the sociology, King majored in sociology. Chivers, likewise, was a, a supporter of the Southern Conference, active in the Southern Negro Youth Congress. His philosophy prof, uh, Sam Williams, who also becomes an executive board member of uh, SCLC, was a leading figure in, in the Atlanta and, and, and Georgia Progressive Party, um, as well as the National Negro Congress, that's a little earlier. But anyway, this is, this, this, this is the crucible. Oh, and, and one of King's best friends was the head of a Southern Negro Youth Congress chapter that existed at Morehouse in that period. So th that, that's the crucible. I think it's not well understood. It's not, it's not just remnants of the old left's ideas through, through, you know, through the seminary. It's actual folks who are still active in, in, mm -hmm. on the ground. Well, King's a college student. Otherwise, it's a bit, more, a bit mysterious why King goes from being a, a, you know, a, a self-proclaimed partier to wanting to commit himself to a life of something. Yeah, again, it's not the only influence, but I think there, it's, it's part of the story that's not well understood. And I should stop. Start there by saying, I think, again, these, these, these strands of both discontinuity and continuity help us to understand both the, the strengths and the limitations of, of the movement. <laughs>